Welcome to Webinar 3, Searching for Humanities, the Promise of Digital. Koralika Golub is Professor at the Department of Cultural Studies at Linnaeus University. She is Head of the I Institute, Co-Leader of the Digital Humanities Initiative and Program Coordinator for Bachelor of Arts in Library and Information Science at the University. Her research has focused on topics related to information retrieval and knowledge organization. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm very happy to be able to share with you some of the research that have been conducted for the past 20 years or so. And that is more related to the fact that the digital indeed provides a promise of what we can do. However, there is still a premise that needs to be fulfilled uh, for that uh, promise to work. We hear a lot about that everything we need is just a click away. Um, we have Siri who has a commercial that says it does more than ever, even before you ask. So we have technology that reads your mind. We have technology on the bottom part of the screen, flowers, which is actually developed and implemented based on how long you look at one image similar images will be retrieved without you doing anything else. Going a little bit into history, from vision to reality, at the turn of the 20th century, Otle and Lachlan are Belgian lawyers who envisioned and started creating something that they called Mondaneum, which is a large library catalog that you see in this image, envisioned to gather everything there is published anywhere in the world, and then to classify it using Universal Decimal Classification, or UDC. Everybody has heard of Memex, uh, imagined by Vannevar Bush, which is a predecessor of hypertext, because in 1945 he envisioned a desk that would do everything. It would have access to microforms, microfilms, papers and all the documents in all forms will be connected in parts where they are related, like hyperlinks or hypertext that we commonly use every day today. And today we can, in theory at least, uh, search across everything through a number of different platforms. We have web search engines, Immediately, we can say that research has shown that 90% of pages get no organic search traffic from Google, meaning that only 10% of pages get search traffic from Google unless they pay for it. We have glamorous glam sector, galleries, libraries, archives and museums, so cultural heritage catalogs such as Union Catalog in Sweden, Libris or Kringla from our host today here. We have discovery services, which may be more known to you as OneSearch or Primo. These are commercial services that university libraries pay access to, and through them you are able to search through one search box everything that the library has, but also everything to what the library subscribes. So all individual databases, uh, as well as uh, interdisciplinary databases, can be in theory, at least search through that. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. We also have individual databases like Scopus or Web of Science or individual uh, disciplinary databases that allows us uh, to search on any topic uh, that is out there that the databases um, covers. However, digital methods and automatic methods do not really work all the way. The challenges of searching basically boil down to uh, three main things. The first one is that we need to know how to translate our need for information to the search query. And if we are just new to the topic we need to uh, find information on, we may not be able to know which search terms to use. The second problem is the fact that the natural language is tricky it's not straightforward. It is filled with ambiguities. As we see on these images, we have letter, sink, and nail that are written in exactly the same way, but mean completely different things. 
and we, these are known as homonies. We also use different words to represent the same concept. For example, jaguar is also known as panther or uh, his Latin names. And if we enter jaguar, we will not get all the relevant documents because it is likely that not all authors use all these terms and the other way around. The third problem is that in all these services that um, we that, that say that we can search across everything, we get way too many results. In these examples, if we search for culture, for example, in Google, we get over 5 billion results. In one search, which is a discovery service, we get over 6 million results. In Libris, we get over 100,000 results. All of them are very much un manageable because users really don't go beyond the first one or two pages of 10, 20 results altogether. And this is all fine. It works in many, for many tasks, for many search scenarios. However, for research or serious public inquiry, what we do need is only accurate information and all accurate information. And the only known way until now to deal with this is something called controlled vocabularies. Here, the terminology is also ambiguous. So you will hear of um, terms such as terminologies, knowledge organization systems, information retrieval thesauri, subject heading systems, classification systems, and so forth. Here is an example of how Google, when it started using Knowledge Graph, already saw the benefit of using disambiguation. So if you write Jaguar, of course you will first get uh, listings related to cars because these will be heavily funded and advertised. But if you scroll down on the bottom right page, you will also see results about Jaguar as the animal. So what you get on the right hand side, thanks to Google's knowledge graph technologies, is really information that Google derives from DBpedia, which is essentially a computer readable version of Wikipedia. In a way, Wikipedia has mechanisms to control um, the problems like homonymy and synonymy of the natural language and Google is relying on that. Over 100 years ago, libraries started creating controlled vocabularies. Dewey Decimal Classification, Library of Congress Classification, Library of Congress Subject Headings are some of the early examples. If we look at uh, Library of Congress Subject Headings and rewrite Macedonia, we get a note that here are entered works on the ancient country and kingdom of Macedonia, etc. And if we prefer to look for other Macedonias, then we should look elsewhere. So there is a disambiguation mechanism ingrained in this controlled vocabulary. In addition, we have mechanisms that specifically define different small facets of what the work can be about. That allows us to have a manageable listing of resources. So if we look for general Macedonia, as described here, we have 53 results. If we want Macedonian antiquities, we have 42. If we want Macedonian antiquities exhibitions, we have five. And this is just the very uh, the beginning of several hundreds of different subject headings that describe Macedonia as disambiguated here, so the ancient country and kingdom. So this is one example of controlled vocabulary that has been used in libraries for many decades now. However, what we see today in these search across everything services is um, that none of this is used, which is why we end up with so many unmanageable results. If we write Macedonia into one search, a common discovery service found in Swedish university libraries, we will get almost 65,000 results. Now, if we rely on subject, if we want disambiguation, I want this specific Macedonia, we can't do that. Instead, we get an automatically produced list of facets, as we see on the right hand side here. 
which are, the research has shown, extremely unclear and unmanageable. Macedonia, followed by Eastern Europe, Greece, politics, Albania, history and archaeology, Croatia. It's just a really um, impossible and unusable thing, as research has shown as well. On the other hand, in theory, library catalogs and other information retrieval services have been following or trying to follow bibliographic objectives. So aims that any information retrieval system that uh, wants to provide good quality information services needs to address. For example, in 1876, already uh, very specifically, anything related to finding an item on the subject has been specified. In 2011, this has been elaborated to a greater level so that we need to be able to find anything described by a given subject label, distinguish between similar resources, select resources which are most relevant due to certain facets or approach to the subject. We need to be able to see them in a context, say higher terms, broader terms, narrower terms, or browse around related topics, which is particularly important if we don't know how to formulate the search term. Browsing is really important and it's not really provided in most services today. Then when it comes to research, what research has found related to finding humanities resources by scholars, students, or general public, although primarily it was scholars that were um, the target in these studies so far, we're looking for primary sources, for example, research data or information objects in cultural heritage collections, or secondary sources like monographs, book chapters, journal articles. Research has shown that uh, unlike natural sciences, humanities scholars have very different characteristics, and yet most systems follow the model of natural sciences. Humanities scholars look for a high level of granularity, meaning their search query terms are very specific, which means that we need to apply indexing at deep specificity. In other words, we need to assign very specific keywords. If a book is about Macedonia, we need to really define which specific aspects are addressed there. Also, unlike natural sciences where common terms are dominant, terms denoting named individuals, geographical terms, chronological terms, and disciplinary terms are extremely important in humanities. Of course, this is not the same for every humanities discipline, but it varies. In literary studies, what is important are authors' names and titles of works as subjects as well. In history, specific instances of historical events, people and regions should all be keywords. Religion, philosophy and psychology are more like natural sciences in that they uh, like common terms also. This implies the need that when we create controlled vocabularies, we need to follow standards. And uh, these standards need to provide for high specificity and account for the different facets. Geographical, chronological and disciplinary terms need to be able to combine in a keyword that will be then assigned to denote the topicality of a work. Today, we're also faced with a growing interdisciplinarity throughout sciences and humanities, and not the least through digital humanities. Meaning that what we are faced with is a vast variety of heterogeneous information objects and digital services across disciplines, which means that we need excellent controlled vocabularies. How the bigger, the, one of the biggest problems uh, since the 1980s when start, things started turning digital is that um, indexing languages, controlled vocabularies that are applied in libraries traditionally for many decades now have really not been used in interfaces. They have not been made so that you can do query expansion, disambiguation, find narrow terms, broader terms, in interfaces. We do have a lot of experimental interfaces, but um, I assume due to 
politics of how software sellers uh, run on the markets, they have never acquired these aspects, which is why we actually suffer as humanities researchers and, and not just humanities actually. So um, what is the state of the art today? If we look at library catalogs, we have controlled vocabularies in the records, but there is no disambiguation and specificity devices for the end user. Meaning if you do write Macedonia, no library catalog will ask you, well, do you mean Macedonia is the ancient kingdom or the part of Greece or the Republic? And this is actually really a pity because this information is ingrained in Library of Congress subject headings that are assigned to the library records that are being searched for. Also, if we look at new services and new digital collections with some examples from Sweden, none of them have controlled vocabularies that support humanity search needs, meaning many of them do not have any controlled vocabularies at all. A few that do, do not support highly faceted needs and uh, the needs for disambiguation and finding uh, related terms. Discovery services like Primo or OneSearch and are uh, really criticized internationally. The uh, access is way under optimal. Throughout the world, discovery services are criticized for the lack of transparency on the processes behind the scenes. We do not know when they take, for example, an MLA database for languages with uh, LISA database for um, information studies with Scopus or Web of Science and they merge them together and cross search them. We don't know what is really happening and there is no documentation available to us. There is serious lack of mappings between metadata elements and their values, meaning that if two different databases use two different controlled vocabularies, these are not aligned and unified meaning that there is no use of them at the time of search. We're all stuck with overwhelming number of results. We don't know what we are missing. We don't know in what way we can influence uh, our search. Post-search facets, as we have seen in the previous slide on Macedonia, are complex and confusing. So in spite of the fact that individual collections and databases have been indexed with controlled vocabularies, None of these are of any use at uh, the time of searching in discovery services. So the question is often raised in research whether providing widened search in loosely controlled discovery services as opposed to traditional library catalogs or individual databases of journal articles, commercial ones, is necessarily an advantage. And again, this may work for known item searching, it may work for quick and dirty searches, but not for subject indexing for serious public inquiry or research when you really need all the relevant information and only relevant information. Also, studies have been conducted on repositories and commercial databases like Diva and Scopus. Scopus claims to be the world's largest commercial abstract and citation database for humanities, covering over 3,000 titles. However, they use zero controlled vocabularies from humanities. Um, research has shown that if some humanities articles do have controlled terms from controlled vocabularies, they are not mapped or aligned and they all come from outside the humanities like medical subject headings or geographical headings. A diva does not use any controlled vocabularies other than um, what is used for statistical purposes. It's based on a Swedish national classification of discipline. It's, it's very broad and very far from the humanities needs of high specificity when uh, talking about aboutness. Also, commercial subject databases with controlled vocabularies are plentiful. They all maintain them and they have them. And here is a list of some examples like Athler Religion Databases, Lisa, Lista, MLA. However, research has shown that their interfaces are so poor when interacting with these controlled vocabularies that 
really um, there is no use of them being there at all. Um, what is also important when uh, in digital humanities or humanities, we often need to create our own metadata and we need to create our own new digital collections that focus on a specific little curious archive that would be uh, very unique and of high value to everybody. What we need to take care of in that case is to then use standards, both at the level of a metadata schema, perhaps you create an application profile on top of a metadata schema if the metadata schema does not account for all the needs. Uh, but especially when it comes to creating subject terms or keywords, we should really start from a controlled vocabulary that is already out there. Many of them are available as linked open data under free licenses. And um, at least what we can do, we can download them and start from there so that we maintain interoperability with the rest of the world, with other collections, so that these uh, collections are accessible through the same interface. And in order to do that, they do need to be interoperable and follow standards. We also need to follow standards to ensure metadata quality, meaning that indexing policies or guidelines on how to assign metadata especially subject metadata need to be in place. We need to ensure that training is in place as well. We, um, research has shown that there is a high inter-indexer uh, inconsistency. So uh, indexing policies are extremely important if we want to provide um, and ensure that good access to information is there. We also need to then create interfaces that support easy use of controlled vocabularies. Otherwise, there is no need for us to use them if we just do simple searches. Well, there is a certain use, but uh, creating additional uh, search parts of a uh, search engine, such as disambiguation or find me broader terms if I get too few results or find me narrower terms if I get too many results, is really very easy to implement. So since we talked mostly about subject searching, how do we go about choosing controlled vocabularies? Well, there are a lot of um, what is called terminology registries. Bartok is the biggest one that has over 300 controlled vocabularies in all uh, disciplines. And it also searches over um, several uh, dozens of other terminology registries. Then there are commercial ones uh, like Taxonomy Warehouse. Um, the advantage is that really they earn money on having these services so they may be more updated. Uh, another open source registry is linked to open vocabularies. And um, also there will be a lot of terminologies uh, following projects like conservation controlled vocabularies as a result of Ligatos project. Some examples of humanities and social sciences terminologies are certainly Getty vocabularies that have been um, based on re research more than um, most of the others. Their art and architecture thesaurus is uh, well faceted and addresses the needs of humanities scholars. I do have to say I haven't seen an interface other than one experimental one that uh, does justice to all the advantages that are, are there. HACET and ELSST are two examples of social sciences which also cover big parts of humanities. ELSST is multilingual, meaning that if we want our um, little collection to be interoperable with Europe, uh, this thesaurus covers 14 languages. And then again, interfaces could be easily built where the translation is automatically done in the background because the mappings already exist. Now, all this is probably giving you headaches um, because it 
is uh, very much resource craving. However, we do have um, bibliographic uh, guidelines on what we should do. And on the other hand, we have uh, the commercial market with uh, not so many software that provide these services and there is um, really a huge gap between of what uh, we should have. Anyway, going to what we can do directly, um, say uh, create our own digital collection or have influence on a digital collection or retrieval system, the alternatives are um, to rely on social tagging or collaborative tagging by end users. Here, um, we also need to use controlled vocabularies. Otherwise, all the effort that is conducted by end users will be in vain because the resulting folksonomies will be unstructured, um, unlinked, there won't be uh, any disambiguation mechanisms and so on. Research has um, conducted social tagging based on Library of Congress subject headings, for example, and users, social taggers, were really happy because they didn't have to think. And um, uh, yeah, the uh, social tagging interface also provided automatic suggestions based on Library of Congress subject headings. And it also showed that it provided them focus because the suggestions were much more focused than they would have had to think about. So they would have, for example, assigned Macedonia period. Instead, Library of Congress subject headings, automatic suggestions provided them with a very detailed aspect. And that effectively showed to contribute to uh, improvement of information retrieval quite significantly as well. Social tagging is also problematic in that we do not know what motivates users and it doesn't always work. Libraries have tried throughout the world over the past 10, 15, 20 years to um, create uh, social tagging interfaces, but few have taken off. On the other hand, some have been very successful, like projects within digital humanities. So social tagging is one alternative to craving resources. Automatic methods are another. However, um, here we also have a lot of problems. We have commercial softwares that claim very high success, yet research has shown that evaluation is highly problematic because context is rarely taken into account and evaluating automatic subject indexing, for example, is uh, loaded with complexities. Also, um, automatic methods still do not work very well beyond text, and they do not work as well on humanities resources as they would um, in an actual science where terms are not so in Think about automatically identifying LGBTQ themes in fiction, where uh, language is on purpose metaphorical. So in conclusion, we have seen that with our systems today, the promise of the digital is really large, but we actually fail to achieve bibliographic objectives. We are stuck with loads of results, which we have no idea which of them are relevant, which of them should be excluded, and which of them we didn't get, even though we got one million. And the question is, what kind of impact on research does it have? Are we missing something important? Does this lead to duplication of effort and waste of resources in, in that sense then? And uh, the premise for searching is really to enrich existing services in order to effectively meet the information needs of scholars and uh, for other users, of course. We need to use controlled vocabularies, ideally those that are available as linked to open data because that automatically links to other collections as well. We need to take care of the mappings that are not there, like in discovery services. And we certainly need to improve interfaces. And this is really not hard, it just hasn't ever been implemented in any commercial interfaces. When creating new digital collections, we need to use existing standards, even for social tagging, in order to keep the uh, interoperability and uh, to uh, keep everything as it should be 
to allow information retrieval uh, as it should be in the end. And um, we could or should probably connect more to international bodies like IFLA is the International Association of uh, Library Associations and Organizations, as well as Swedish national strategic bodies in order to push uh, for this for more because we need to get um, uh, our needs as, as they are. Otherwise, we don't know what uh, the losses are. Some references um, are given here at the end. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention.